Hey everyone, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm Jake Gagne, the Jock Reynolds Fellow in Public Programs here in the Gallery's Education Department. And I just wanna thank you all for coming together on this Friday afternoon for our e-study tour, representing counterculture selections from Exit Arts print portfolios. Today, we are very lucky to have two speakers, Alyssa Waters and Jenna Marvin, who I will introduce in just a minute. But first I wanted to share some housekeeping notes. So we are in a Zoom webinar, which you may already know, means that we cannot see or hear you, but we do have some very useful tools that will allow you to participate and communicate with staff members and with Jenna and Alyssa. So at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll have a toolbar with a button that says Q&A. And this is a feature that'll allow you to submit questions for our presenters. We will do our best to answer everyone's questions, uh, but there is a pretty good chance we won't get to everyone's because that's how these things often go. There's also a chat button, which you can use if you wanna just share comments for everyone who's in the room, or if you wanna reach out to a staff member directly about um, technical issues. But again, any questions about the content of the presentations for Jenna and Alyssa, we would recommend that you use the Q&A feature. So today's presenters, uh, Alyssa Waters is the Florence B. Selden Fellow in the Department of Prints and Drawings. She received a BA from Dartmouth College and an MA in Art History from Williams College and the Clark Art Institute. Alyssa's research interests include European modernism, artist books, and the history of printmaking. Jenna Marvin is the Marsha Brady Tucker Fellow in the Department of Photography. She has a BA from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and an MA in Art History from Williams College and the Clark Art Institute. Jenna's research interests span the full history of photography as well as its intersections with science and the American South. So Jenna's, Jenna and Alyssa will each give a presentation of about 10 to 15 minutes, followed by a short talk back between the two of them. And then I will rejoin to moderate a Q&A um, with questions from the audience. And just as a final note, we, we are planning to send a follow-up email that includes information about the artworks discussed in today's programs, as well as some books um, for further reading. And the email will also include a short survey, which we encourage you to fill out as um, that information helps us to think about the future of programming uh, as we navigate this virtual and non-virtual world. So thank you again, everyone for making it and for being here with us. And I turn it over to Elissa Waters. Thank you, Jake, for that introduction. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to our, our summer or near summer PDP study tour. At the gallery, both Jenna and I are really involved with the James E. Duffy study room for prints, drawings, and photographs, which is located on the fourth floor of the Louis Kahn building. In normal times, the study room is extremely active with visits from classes, students, scholars, and members of the general public who make appointments with us to see very, various objects in the gallery's prints and drawings and photography collections. We also frequently host public programs in this space, including monthly thematic tours. While we're conducting today's program virtually, we hope that when the study room reopens, you'll visit the space and see the objects we're discussing today or other works of interest to you in person. I should note that our permanent collection galleries actually opened to the public today or reopened to the public today. So please visit our website for more information and to reserve time tickets if you're in the area and would like to visit. I'm thrilled that Jenna and I decided to focus on Exit Arts print portfolios today because these portfolios have intrigued me for years. Physically, each of the 14 portfolios has a colorful textured cover adorned with Exit Arts logo, logo, as you can see in the bottom left here. Within each portfolio lie between six and 10 prints by a diversity of artists working in various styles, media, and themes. Each portfolio paired younger artists with more established ones and included at least one artist working in the print medium for the first time. These portfolios serve two main purposes, to promote the artists represented, represented 
and to raise funds for exit art. They were released nearly annually between 1995 and 2011. So what was exit art? <laughs> exit art was an alternative art space in New York City. It was founded in 1982 by art historian and curator Jeanette Ingberman and conceptual artist Papo Colo, seen here at right. Its physical space was first located in Soho and later moved to Hell's Kitchen. In its spaces, Exit Art hosted a variety of exhibitions, performances, and programs throughout the 30 years of its existence. It closed in 2012, the year after Ingberman's death. The aim of the organization was to give marginalized artists opportunities to, pro to produce and display their work and to promote, as Colo put it, another way of seeing the culture. The following quote expresses the organization's mission perfectly. Exit as entrance. Every exit is also an entrance. The way out is also the way in. Exit signs are everywhere, in schools, in restaurants, in every part of society. It's a symbol, a collective symbol we see in all of those exit signs. The word is a whole philosophy, a politics, a way of escaping to another space, of exiting from the mainstream, of creating independence, from previous ways of doing things, of mapping an island of experimentation. It's here that I want to begin my talk about the role of cartoon characters in three objects from the exit art print portfolios. Like exit signs, cartoon characters are everywhere. They're also symbols, collective symbols of not just the specific stories in which they appear, but also the cultural moments in which they were created. The artists of these three prints use cartoonish figures to challenge, critique, and even protest the popular culture from which their recognizable imagery comes. Known for working on a large scale, messily, and in black and white, Joyce Pensato pushed against the small, quaint, brilliantly colored renditions of Mickey Mouse, Homer Simpson, and other popular cartoon characters that she took as her subjects. In this image of Felix the Cat, Pensato went over a lithographic print with charcoal, pastel, and fixative to create frenetic gestural marks. Pensato's mark making is often described as distressed or distressing. Its roughness introduces a kind of violence that's further underlined here by the figure's missing arm and leg. The title of the print, Psycho Killer Felix, actually suggests that the cartoon character itself is a violent creature, a psycho killer. Is Pensado simply alluding to the predatorial nature of cats who hunt for their food? Is she alluding to racial violence represented and in a way reenacted by Felix the cat because he's a minstrel character and so underlines the racial biases that endure in pop culture? While Pensado never seems to have discussed the racial implications of her work, the connection is unavoidable, especially because her work is so rooted in juxtapositions between black and white humor and violence. The title Psycho Killer Felix might also be more self-reflexive and self-critical. It might suggest that Pensado herself is the aggressive agent, having fiercely rubbed and scribbled over her drawing of Felix. Or it might reference the aggressive confrontation in Pensado's work between original personal artistic expression and kitschy representations derived from mass culture, between abstract expression, expressionism and pop art. Regardless of one's reading of this image and its title, it's clear that Pensado's imagery is not simply a humorous visual reinterpretation of a popular cartoon character, but something edgier, more unsettling and critical. Artist Chitra Ganesh similarly uses cartoonish imagery to challenge contemporary norms. Her print for exit art titled Gravity's Dream exemplifies this. In this print, comic-like aesthetics express a feminist critique. Adhered Google eyes and glitter are reminiscent of children's arts and crafts, but the image itself is actually quite violent. Parts of the female body are detached and sometimes rearranged to form uncanny figures. For example, on the right, we see a decapitated head with a finger protruding from its chin and an enlarged tongue or some other strange form emerging from its mouth. 
One eye with a pink pupil is wide open. The other eye is missing entirely. A pool of blood forms at the base of the neck. At left, another odd but seemingly female creature gazes out at us. One of its hands forms a Buddhist hand gesture signaling power and knowledge. Its other hand reaches out to touch a headless, torso-less, one-armed figural form between the legs. Pain and pleasure, violence and sex intermin intermingle in this dual scene of mental calmness and physical frenzy. In Ganesha's own words, her work brings to light narrative representations of femininity, <clears throat> sexuality, and power typically, typically absent from canons of literature and art. In this piece specifically, Ganesh seems to push back against the traditional notions of female beauty that female beauty derives from bodily perfection, perfection, quote unquote, that women cannot or should not touch themselves or one another, that serenity and wisdom are incompatible with sexual desire. Again, the title, Gravity's Dream, seems apt, though ambiguous. Is gravity a force, an entity, or a metaphor for societal rules? Does the dream depicted defy gravity or embrace it? I would suggest that the figures here resist gravity and societal norms. Unlike typical cartoon characters, they float, flip, twist, and turn in unexpected and unnatural ways. Their resistance represents an empowered femininity and sexuality that subverts the misogynistic narratives commonly found in pop, contemporary pop culture. William Villalongo's exit art print similarly uses cartoonish imagery to engage with difficult, difficult and problematic histories. This piece likely takes its title and inspiration from a 1978 Martin Gay song titled A Funky Space Reincarnation. At least on one level, the song is about a man who tries to con convince a woman he loves to go with him to space where I quote, music won't have no race. Space is a complicated place in Gay's song. He describes it as funky, peaceful, and terrible, all in the same verse. But I think this complexity is important and is actually one of the things Bill Longo is picking up on in his print. In talking about another work in the gallery's collection, Bill Longo has said the following. Palimpsest is about the abstraction that develops around Black lives as a result of a cycle of violence, protest, and erasure. I want to suggest the body as an abstraction, one of resiliency and flux that rewrites itself as it moves through the world, one that embraces visibility and invisibility as a condition of being. While Villa Longo made Funky Space Reincarnation about a decade before Palimpsest, this quote is relevant and revealing. All cartoon figures are abstractions in a way, but, this, but the one in this print is especially so. Its blob-like shape, enormous eyes, and comic multicolored tendrils remove it from a re reality we recognize. Yet Villalongo has situated this figure in our world, painting it on top of a photograph of a terrestrial forest. Also, the figure's, eye, the figure's eyes express relatable human emotions, uncertainty, anxiety, maybe even fear. As for the vibrantly colored skyscape that shows through the middle of the figure, is it a reflection of the figure's inner state of being? Is it a window into another world, either on earth or elsewhere? Or does it suggest that this seemingly solid, unmistakable black acrylic figural form might be looked through as though it doesn't exist, as though the figure teeters at the edge of visibility and invisibility, that fragile condition of being. In fact, maybe that's what all three of these works share, a recognition that cartoons are signifiers and that as signifiers, cartoons meanings are multiple and mutable. Pensado, Ganesh, and Villalongo all use cartoon-like aesthetics to challenge popular culture and, to, and the problematic norms and histories these aesthetics represent. But they're only able to do so by capitalizing on the easy and inherent adaptability of the cartoon. Cartoon characters are then the perfect metaphor for the body that's continually in flux, 
that continually rewrites itself as it moves through the world, to quote Villalongo again. Because Pensado borrowed existing cartoon characters, her imagery, imagery is perhaps more immediately understandable, at least on an initial level. By creating their own unique characters, Ganesh and Villalongo challenge us to work harder to comprehend their prints. Regardless, to varying degrees, all three artists employ popular visual imagery to confront our normative expectations and understandings. The cartoon then straddles the mainstream and the marginal. It is both an entrance and an exit. As exit art founders Ingberman and Colo said, the way out is also the way in. This duality embodies the institution, its mission, and its practices more broadly. To end with a final quote from Colo, we are an exit from the mainstream and an exit from the commercial world to the other world, but also an entrance. We are a passage between dimensions, exit to entrance, entrance to exit, push and pull the metaphor of life. In and out, we reproduce. Thank you all. And now I will turn the floor over to Jenna. Thank you, Alyssa, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I think your point about the connection between the everyday nature of ordinary exit science and cartoons is very apt because it points to the way that exit art tried to find critiques in ordinary places in dominant mainstream culture. One of exit art's founders, Papo Colo, has stated that alternative spaces construct parallel histories or different ways to interpret our past, present, and future. This tension between culture and counterculture, which you pointed out, was often visible in exit arts programming as its curators featured artists that were frequently denied access to mainstream institutions due to their race, gender, religion, sexuality, or political beliefs. Today, I want to think through exit arts print portfolios and the broader alternative arts-based landscape through one particular work by the American artist Fred Wilson entitled X which was included in Exit Art's 2005 print portfolio, Tantra. I want to consider how this work by Wilson provides us with a model for understanding the contradictions inherent in alternative art spaces. How can these oppositional forces between mainstream and alternative spaces create a more nuanced understanding of all art institutions? Before we begin, I must note that I will be discussing enslavement and its long legacy of systemic racism in the United States, as Wilson explicitly engages with these connections in his work. Wilson's X pairs images of two historical and cultural icons, a photograph of the black activist and thinker Malcolm X, and John Singer Sargent's 1984 painting of the Parisian socialite Virginie Amélie Avignon Gautreau, Madame X. In a 2001 interview, Wilson stated, quote, juxtaposition is perhaps the most fruitful and satisfying way of working for me. I like pairing disparate objects to distill a complex thought to its essence. What is Wilson distilling in this pairing? I want to examine this work in some detail before returning to exit art and the politics of alternative spaces. Perhaps the first thing one notices about this work, even before recognizing these figures, is that Wilson has flipped their tones to resemble a photographic negative. The work is even printed on a plasticky surface called Duratrans, which mimics the luster and shine of a plastic negative. Madame X's white skin is uniformly darkened, whereas Malcolm X's blackness is more difficult to read as a negative. The photograph's light source brightly illuminates the skin of his face, creating a gradation of tones from the impenetrable darkness of his forehead where the light strikes it, to the now white shadow beneath his jawline. Born Malcolm Little, he adopted the letter X as his last name to stand in for his African ancestry that had been obscured by enslavement. In addition to, be one, in addition to being one of the most identifiable images of Malcolm, this particular photograph has historical significance. It was taken on March 26, 1964, the day he had his one and only brief meeting with the civil rights activist, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Malcolm X and Dr. King had been at odds over how best to combat and end segregation and systemic racism in the United States for a number of years, but they were both present in Washington, D.C. on this day to attend Senate hearings for the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The meeting lasted only moments, and the two would not meet again as Malcolm X was assassinated less than a year later in February of 1965. 
The negative of this photograph is in the collection of the Library of Congress. This image is a scan of the negative with the tones digitally flipped to resemble a positive. The negative is titled Malcolm X Waits at Martin Luther King Press Conference, Head and Shoulders Portrait. The word waits signals the gravity of this historical moment fraught with tension. And the word portrait monumentalizes Malcolm X's figure as if this was a sculptural bust. Similarly, Sargent's infamous painting of Madame X contains a hidden historical narrative as well. The sitter, Virginie Amélie Avignon Gautreau, though she lived in France for the majority of her life, was born in Louisiana in 1859 to a European Creole family that owned the Parlange plantation. Her mother moved with her to France in 1867. She was born in 1867, and her, her mother moved with her to France after her father, a Confederate officer, died in the American Civil War. In 1878, at the age of 19, she married 40-year-old French banker and colonial goods importer Pierre Gautreau. She became a fixture of upper-class Parisian society, known for her characteristic application of lavender powder to enhance the fairness or whiteness of her skin. In 1884, Sargent painted her portrait and displayed it at the French Salon, where it caused a scandal for its overt sexuality and salacious posing. Hence the redaction of her name in favor of the letter X. Sargent originally painted the right strap of her dress fallen slack off of her shoulder, and he amended the painting after its display at the French Salon, but before selling it to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York in 1916, the year after Avignon Gautreau died. Here you can see where Madame X hangs in the Met's American galleries, just to the left of center in this image. While at first Wilson's pairing of Malcolm X and Madame X may appear arbitrary based on the adoption of the letter X in their names, a new narrative and relationship between the two figures begins to form. Commenting on the logic of this work, Wilson has stated, quote, I trust the visual to communicate my ideas. I try to unlock the meanings of objects by juxtaposing and eliciting a conversation between them that creates an unexpected but essential thought. The connection between Madame X and Malcolm X is a history of racist and capitalist violence. Virginie Gautreau's family fortune was built on enslavement. And as a Creole American living in Paris, she was seen as a sort of quote unquote exotic outsider, despite her white European ancestry. Contrary to popular understanding, the word Creole is not a fixed racial identity, but a cultural and linguistic one. Uncertainty around Gautreau's race is palpable in text written during her lifetime. In 1880, a writer for the Sunday Herald, a Washington DC newspaper wrote about Avignon Gautreau, quote, those diamonds were bought with the produce of sugarcane and coffee plantations. She was brought up in subtropical ease and listlessness. Her husband is a rich importer of colonial goods and happy to see her enjoy herself in her own way. 19th century commentary about Gautreau's subtropical exoticism casts a new light on Wilson's choice to depict Madame X and Malcolm X's negatives. Wilson provides us with a clue as to the racial anxiety, and in Gautreau's case, the racial confusion that links these two figures. And speaking of links, there is one point of contact between Malcolm X and Madame X that I have not addressed, and that is the physical link between them. Madame X's hand grips Malcolm X's shoulder. In Sargent's painting, Avonio Gautreau's hand is twisted unnaturally as she leans against the table. In Wilson's composite image, her hand appears to clasp Malcolm X's shoulder. Is this a gesture of support? Or is this grip sinister, a reminder of America's complex and often hidden history of racist exploitation? Here, I would like to turn back to exit art and alternative spaces more broadly to forge a connection between Wilson's pairing in X with a pairing of my own alternative art spaces, and mainstream art and financial institutions. Exit Art, founded and run by artist Papo Colo and curator and scholar Jeanette Ingerman, existed from 1982 to 2012 during the heyday of alternative art spaces in New York City. Alternative art spaces were often run by artists in informal associations with communities. These kinds of spaces gained prominence in New York in the 1960s in opposition to bureaucratic mainstream art museums like the Museum of Modern Art and the Whitney Museum of American Art. Alternative art spaces could be spontaneous, mobile, and free from the political constraints that govern curatorial choices in large museums with boards of trustees and opaque funding structures. Many of these spaces are still around today, including Artist Space, MoMA PS1, AIR Gallery, and White Columns. 
For a while, these spaces relied exclusively on private funding, but in 1972, the National Endowment for the Arts, or NEA for short, began to offer government funding for these spaces. The NEA was signed into law by President Johnson in 1965, just one of a number of pieces of legislation that was meant to alter the political landscape in the United States, including the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Though funding for alternative spaces was minuscule in comparison to funding appropriated for theaters, operas, and major museums, alternative spaces were disproportionately hurt during the culture wars of the 1980s. Conservative politicians in the Reagan and first Bush administrations railed against public funding for spaces that were seen as un-American or critical of United States policies. Exit art typified this sort of space, producing shows that questioned the political status quo, including their inaugural exhibition, Illegal America, that called attention to government censorship in the arts. In addition to apply for, receive, and document government funding for tax purposes, alternative spaces had to become more like institutions, relying on art administrators and extensive bookkeeping. In 1995, the NEA eliminated the artist's organizations category from its funding structure entirely. Therefore, it may not be a coincidence that Exit Art began producing their annual fundraising print portfolios that same year. The portfolios were collected not only by private individuals, but also by major and mainstream art institutions like the Museum of Modern Art and the Whitney Museum of American Art. In 2004, Exit Art mounted a retrospective exhibition of their print portfolios, noting that, quote, the entire collection can be seen as a history of contemporary printmaking. It is in the wake of this slash in public funding and reflection on their own printmaking and fundraising endeavors that Fred Wilson contributed X to the 2005 portfolio Tantra. Dr. Ima Ramos, the curator of South Asian collections at the British Museum defined Tantra in a recent exhibition, quote, the Sanskrit word Tantra derives from the verbal root tan, meaning to weave or compose and refers to a type of instructional text often written as a dialogue between a god and a goddess. End quote. Tantra can also be defined as an unbroken continuity. In light of these definitions, Fred Wilson's X presents us with an uneasy dialogue between two figures across time and media. Exit Art's co-founder, Papo Colo, an artist, curator, and printmaker herself, has written extensively on Exit Art's mission and his own beliefs about the radicality of art, print, and alternative spaces. In a brief manifesto titled, Alter the Native, Colo writes, History is a complex set of events that we organize at our convenience. Wilson's ex asks us, what can be gained through reorganizing history in this way, conversationally, between two figures that seemingly have little in common, and in fact, existed in opposition? I argue that this is also a productive way to think about alternative art spaces and mainstream institutions like museums. They seemingly exist in opposition, but in fact, their involvement, often through hidden trails of money, are linked. We can produce a richer conversation and a richer and more complex history if we examine the ways in which these hidden links forge connections. I will conclude with one quote by Wilson. Quote, objects speak to me. I put them in dialogue with the institution. I may start with an idea, but I never start with an answer, end quote. Indeed, X may not give us definitive answers, but it prompts us to ask important questions. For instance, how do you all interpret Madame X's hand on Malcolm X's shoulder? I look forward to your questions and comments when we move into the Q&A portion of this program. Thank you. Jenna, thank you so much for that talk. Um, so just to give everyone an outline now, Jenna and I will pose a couple of questions to one another, and then we'll open it up to, to Q&A from the audience. But Jenna, just to kind of take off on the idea of the negative, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. I find it so interesting in the idea of reversal, not just the black and whiteness of it, um, but also, you know, the idea of the reversal. Obviously, this is a digital, a digital print, so it's an intentional choice for Wilson to be making it appear like a negative. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that and what you think it means for this for this piece. Definitely. I mean, it 
you're, you're absolutely correct. It is a very intentional choice. Um, and it's really a multi-layered choice, uh, black and white, particularly thinking about the racial anxieties involved in that, in that flipping of tones. Um, Wilson also signed the piece in, in white, um, which I think is very interesting. And it just kind of shows that he's really thinking about this critically and it's, it's very multi-layered and well-considered. Um, the, the material itself, Duratrans, it's a, invented in the 1970s by Eastman Kodak. And we actually see Duratrans all the time. Um, it's most commonly used on advertisements that have a light box behind them. Um, I see them all the time in airports and train stations. Um, think of Times Square. Um, in New York. And so there is that link to the commercial as well. It's a material that's like very widely used and we, we see it all the time. And it's kind of disconnected from its from its function as a, a visual media. We don't think of advertisements as art, but there's a lot of productive slippage there um, materially. And you're right, the reversal from left to right is a really important part of photography and printmaking. Um, importantly, Madame X is not reversed here. Um, it really is just a flipping of tones. And the Photograph of Malcolm X, I don't think it's flipped. I've been trying to figure out whether the Library of Congress um, digitally flipped um, their image of the negative throughout this whole process, and I have not been able to find an answer. Um, but you know, there's three really interesting qualities of negatives that we talked about, the flipping of tones, reversal, but also uh, singularity. Negatives are generally unique, um, you know, which is, it seems kind of at odds with the idea of printmaking and photography to have just one, um, unique object, but that was something I actually wanted to ask you is how do you see that tension in the works that you looked at between singularity and um, the multiple, because there's also handwork and hand finishing in a lot of the prints um, that you talked about today. Yeah, definitely. I This is something that actually drew me to these specific pieces, because there are there are prints in the portfolio that are purely print, print media. Mm -hmm. um, but the three works that I was talking about all include these kind of hand applied elements, whether in, you know, the Ganesh, it's these kind of hand applied googly eyes and glitter and, and other kind of added elements. Um, in the Pensado, there's a lot of kind of rubbing out and scraping and just general manipulation, distressed or distressing manipulation. Um, of the lithographic image. And then in the Villa Longo, he's actually hand painted in that figure um, on top of the, the photographic image. So I think it's like you, like you were saying, I think one of the most important things is this idea of singular versus multiple and prints are multiple, but once you have a hand element, it sort of makes them singular. And something that I'm really interested in <laughs> haven't um haven't really been able to look into in any sort of depth yet is how much consistency there is across the different portfolios because these portfolios where all of the prints we're talking about were produced in multiple so i guess the artists you know would have done that handwork on every single individual print and i wonder how similar i'm guessing they're quite similar but i'm i'm curious about the artist process and haven't been able to talk to any of the artists yet about what their process was like to ensure that they were similar across across the different um the different different impressions so to speak so but yeah i think it also ties directly into like exit arts program and this idea of you know print culture as being disseminate you know well widely disseminated prints as being widely disseminated but what happens if you then make them kind of more singular there's sort of a push pull with the whole idea of kind of the commercialization of arts and specifically of print that is also going on uh, when you have that added hand element. Um, so let's turn now, I like I want to turn now more to exit art. I think that that's kind of a segue into this. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit because I know you were talked about a lot about kind of exit art and its funding structure. Um, I'm wondering what is the culture that exit art and the artist involves are, are countering or are critiquing. Um, and similarly, kind of what is the mainstream and what is the marginal? Wow. <laughs> I'll try and keep my response like relatively concise because I know that we want to answer um, questions from the audience too. I'll start with the mainstream and marginal um, question. I think it's really important to, to note that like these aren't static designations. I, I think that a, a lot of the writing 
especially after Exit Art closed and the kind of the retrospective look back on Exit Art's legacy and the legacy of other spaces like it, a lot of curators are asking, how did Exit Art change museums? And so there is this back and forth pull, you know, alternative spaces like Exit Art, they react uh, to museums and they react to mainstream spaces and they critique them. And then in turn, museums will often incorporate those critiques and then, you know, move in certain ways toward alternative spaces as um, alternative spaces push the idea of like, what is art? Like, how, would, how do you display it? How do you, how do you fund it? How do you produce it? Um, so alternative and mainstream, they're constantly moving. It's kind of a, a cycle um, back and forth. Um, one scholar, uh, Mary Stanisuski, has said that um, alternative spaces and mainstream spaces just exist in this eternally unfinished cycle. Like it's always, it's always moving and there's always an alternative space kind of moment happening, but they look different depending on what they're reacting to. Um, I, I know Papa Polo has also talked about that, um, having to be adaptable, that being alternative means constantly reimagining um, how, how you make art and what you think art means. Um, so constantly in flux. <laughs> um, you know, and one of the, one of the, the pluses of that is that um, museums are much more comfortable at integrating certain kinds of critique into, into their own work. Um, Fred Wilson's actually a great example of this. He works with museums frequently to point out areas of their collection that are not accessible, that um, don't reflect um, the values that museums purport in their visions and their mission statements, um, you know, purport to share. So there are ways in which institutional critique is, is a very um, commonplace part of museums in a way that they weren't, that wasn't in the 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, I know that you and I were both thinking about this as we were writing these talks and institutional critique was such an important part of our education. Um, you know, it's like always a unit in undergraduate art history courses. And I, I know we both read a lot of um, institutional critique essays and articles um, when we were in our master's program. So it's something that because Exit Art and institutions like it push on museums for them to always be thinking about reinventing themselves, museums do have to respond to that critique from the outside. Um, yeah, I'm, I have so many thoughts. It's so hard to pull them <laughs> into something that's, uh, that's coherent. Um, I'll address the uh, question about culture. One of the things that I like so much about uh, the Wilson work, which I chose to, to really think about in depth, is that it expands the definition of culture for me. Um, you know, this piece is ostensibly about two historical figures, but when you start to learn about both of those figures and the, the source material, the photograph of Malcolm X and the painting of Madame X, um, it's just so much more complicated than two people. It's about a web that, that stretches out between them. And that, you know, that web is the construction of history. Um, so culture is everything. You know, culture is both the things that are visible and probably more important, the things that are invisible, those webs that connect people. And so it's kind of a cop out, but um, culture is everything. <laughs> <laughs> invisible and invisible and I think that and this is true to exit art's sort of founding philosophy is everything is open for critique like nothing's off the table um which is a really important part of the way that they explore art making if that makes sense yeah it's so interesting to me this idea of culture especially given that you know Papacolo is from Puerto Rico and um and the artists they're engaging are also, you know, many Americans, but from all over the world. And so this idea of the culture, I always find it interesting that it's singular when he talks, of, at least when Colo talks about it, he usually is using the singular. So this idea that there is kind of a shared culture throughout the world or, or you know, that there's this kind of slippage between American values and kind of, you know, trans, transatlantic values and culture and there's a real kind of mobility and um yeah and universality that I find really interesting because I think yeah. we to think of culture as being more region specific in many instances yeah definitely definitely so I guess just a, a last question before we turn over to <laughs> Q&A is what do you think of when you think of alternative art spaces today because obviously our world has has changed um from when exit art was operating i mean that's such a good question i'll 
I'll ramble about it for, for a moment and I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back to you because I'm interested in what you think as well to this question because it's really, it's, you know, it's a really important one that we all need to be asking ourselves. Um, for me, it's important to remember that an alternative space in 2021 will not look anything like an alternative space from the 60s or the 80s. Um, you know, I think you mentioned in your talk that, you know, Exit Art was based out of Soho and then Hell's Kitchen and just thinking about like New York rents. <laughs> Storefronts are incredibly expensive, and so thinking about funding an art institution to pay the rent, it, it, it becomes harder and harder. And so I think of an alternative space today, it has to be kind of unthinkable. It, it maybe won't have a physical space. It'll exist in, you know, really a digital world. Um, they, it's so hard also to think about alternative spaces because they kind of have to be unthinkable. Right, like they kind of have to be unimaginable. They have to push us um, to think about all art institutions in a new way. So um, something like the recent um, strike at MoMA comes to mind, who, you know, uh, workers who are on strike and are protesting for more equitable conditions at the Museum of Modern Art. Like in what way is that an alternative space? And what way are they creating alternative spaces online as well through social media? Um, Forensic architecture also comes to mind. They're a research firm, um, an interdisciplinary research firm. I think they're based out of Goldsmiths in the UK and they basically do research on human rights abuses around the globe. And in what way is that an artistic practice? Um, you know, we need to question like, what does artistic practice look like when we're thinking about what is an alternative space? And so, I, I mean, to me, the takeaway is you always have to be open about what an art space can be. You know, that that is that's the important bit and alternative spaces should make mainstream spaces uncomfortable because they question the status quo on, on a really radical level so I, I might turn it back to you i'm interested in what you think too about this question yeah i think it's really it's so interesting because like you said i think it, sometimes it takes a little bit of kind of retrospect to really see what the alternative spaces of the moment are um I mean, maybe with Exit Art's a little bit different because they knew they were an alternative space when they were operating. That's what they called themselves. But in this day and age, you're like, what are the alternative spaces? The digital, for sure, gives a lot of opportunity. Um, yeah, Strike Magma is an interesting example. I think the street is still a place for it. And I think even of like Black Lives Matter protests and all the kind of signs and street art that was created alongside those protests and, you know, pro-immigration protests. I mean, there has been a lot of kind of art created. And again, the question is, how do you define art? But I would say there's been a, like a lot of artistic creation that's been done around those. And so do those materials then potentially become, um, become like an enduring mark of um, an alternative art space that happened in a, in a public space out in the open. And as you said, also academia. I mean, it's a huge place of critique. And of course that's a fine line because you're critiquing the institution you're a part of, um, but it's still, you know, that's where a lot of this critique is happening as well. So yeah, it's interesting. And I think about even how, <laughs> I know I mentioned this the other day when we were talking, but like the Banksy piece that got shredded when it, you know, went to auction as soon as it sold, <laughs> it just like half shredded. And so in a way, there's a kind of, that's, you know, another example of institutional critique actually entering an institutional space, actually taking part in the art market. Um, and I think that's complicated. We can, can kind of get in, that's kind of its own conversation, but yeah, the way in which critique is in many ways kind of cropping up in institutions is also an interesting, an interesting thread. Yeah. So maybe, cool. yeah. So maybe with that, we should turn it over to audience Q&A. Jake, would you like to come back and share the audience's questions? I would be honored. Um, thank you for getting this conversation started. Uh, I think there's already some really interesting threads. I love the idea of like the unthinkable alternative art space almost as like a kind of like goal or call to action for those who wanna kind of like critique um, dominant structures. So we have, first I'll just say, so Liz Gallerani from Wickma Williams College Museum of Art says hi. Hi Liz, thank you for, for being here. And then we've gotten a number of questions. Um, and the first one 
is for Elissa. And this questioner is wondering what type of print the Villa Longo is. And I guess maybe this is also an opportunity to think about other aspects of the different media and materialities of the prints you discussed um, that you'd want to draw out. Sure. So the Villa Longo is a pigmented print with die cut velour flocking and acrylic hand painting. Um, so Jenna is probably better equipped to talk about exactly what a pigmented print is. I don't know if it's ancient or something else. Um, and the die cut velour flocking, I don't know exactly, exactly how it's being applied, but I'm guessing it's the, the black part of the, um, of the figure is probably some sort of velour material that he has cut out and adhered to the um, primary support to the paper. Um, and the acrylic hand painting is the, I would guess, the more colored parts. Um, this is a little bit of, a, of guesswork because I don't think I've seen this piece in person, certainly not recently. So I'm not entirely sure where all the elements are. Um, Jenna, do you have a guess at the, like exactly what pigmented, pigmented print would be? Yeah, so the pigment that really just refers to the kind of division in digital um, photographic printing between um, dye based um, dye based inks and pigment based ones. And so this would be um, a print from a digital um, a digital file um, with a digital printer that lays down small um, small dots of, of pigment. Um, so a, a photograph that's produced with a printer, essentially. All right, so we've gotten some uh, some fairly sophisticated questions about exit art, so I will read them. Uh, the first question is, is there information surrounding the fundraising decision by the two founders of exit art to issue the annual portfolios? Were they influenced by the success of Gemini GEL, a for-profit printmaking enterprise in Los Angeles in which mainstream artists, i.e. those who had secondary market success, created editions? Um, and what was Exit Arts selection process? Great question. Are great questions. And we wish we had more information about this. Um, <laughs> Jenna, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Well, it was a source of angst for us because this is, you know, we're living through a pandemic and the archives of Exit Art are all at the Fales Library at NYU. And so in normal times, Alyssa and I would have taken the train down and would have spent, you know, a day going through the development files and looking at the, the artist files as well to see the correspondence between Exit Art's curators and the artists that we're working with to kind of see the conversations around like how these works are being commissioned. Um, but unfortunately, we weren't able to do that. And that's definitely something that I'm interested in doing. Um, in the future because I, I have a bunch of questions I want answered. Um, and as far as Gemini, I'm actually not sure. I would love to see that too. I would love to see um, internal documents from Exit Art about really how they decided um, in 1995 that they wanted to do this. I've looked through their development files um, that are digitized and have seen trends in the way their funding worked, um, especially NEA funding, because I was thinking about that. But I haven't really seen the thought process behind it. And it's something that I'm, I'm definitely interested in as well. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I would just add that, so I don't know exactly what their relationship with, with Gemini and Tamarind or other um, major printers of the time might have been, but I do, but I mean, obviously, you know, artists were really interested in prints, they still are today, and it was a great fundraising tool. And one thing that I would note which is just a distinction between exit art and some of these other um, and like actual printers like Gemini is exit art didn't have the the same kind of profit drive um, and actually these print portfolios were made in part for fundraising but Yale's cop Yale's portfolios and I know also William the portfolios that the Williams College Museum of Art has they were gifts of exit art. So they weren't actually purchased by the museums, which I think is interesting. Um, and they were actually gifted, the Williams portfolio, I think portfolios were gifted, I think in 2012. So the, actually the year exit art closed and ours were donated in 2013. 
2013, the following year, although maybe the conversation started earlier, I'm not sure. Um, but I just think that's interesting also to think about, you know, the, that at least the portfolios in these two museum collections were gifted by Exit Art and upon the, the organization's closing. So there is this kind of, and that's not to say that, you know, printers like Gemini don't gift some of their prints. They certainly do, and we have some in the collection. But, um, but it is interesting to kind of think that not all these portfolios were actually sold when they were made. Some of them were stayed with Exit Art and then were, were gifted upon the organization's closing. So I don't know, the question of funding is kind of a funky one because I wonder how much they, they were, money they were actually bringing in, um, how important they actually were for fundraising and how much of it was more about disseminate, disseminating the ideas and kind of promoting the artists. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that question also like one thing I was wondering, and maybe this is something that would only become clear with more research is like, to what extent the, these portfolios created like new relationships between artists and like ways of, of thinking and cross pollinating each other's work. It's like, yeah, a totally exciting area of thought. But I want to move on to another um, question about exit art and kind of it's kind of like the dialectical relationship that you all were identifying between like mainstream institutions and these kind of forces of critique. So this person asks, has someone mapped for the years of Exit's existence year by year, the major exhibitions at the major NYC establishment museums mm -hmm. to detect whether the portfolios or any of them uh, were created in reaction to that year's exhibitions or exhibitions in the recent past. Uh, also, this was the time period during which museums discovered that a great part of their revenue depended on presenting quote unquote blockbuster shows. Do any of the portfolios address this rabid commercialization in the museum world? Do you want to go first, Alyssa, and I'll, I'll keep thinking? Sure. So I guess I'll just take on the first part of the question to start. Um, someone has mapped the exhibitions that Exit Art put on. There's actually a fantastic book about Exit Art that literally, literally year by year and within each year, like chronologically maps all of their exhibitions and, and projects. And it's a great resource and something that I would be interested in doing if there were more time in life would be to kind of go through and see how those those exhibitions in their own space changed over time, um, especially around the years when NEA funding was shifting or when they were kind of starting to get move away from private funding and getting more NEA funding. Um, as for the, but as for, you know, whether they were reacting to major exhibitions at major New York City establishment museums, that I'm not sure of. So I know that they're, the artists they're working with are a combination of established artists like Fred Wilson, um, to a certain degree, maybe Joyce Pensato, uh, Marina Abramovich, um, some like big name artists. Or, and so they are working with artists that are well known as well as artists that are not so well known. Um, but I don't know how much they are specifically looking to major art museums. My hunch would be that they're more focused on critique and it, they're not reacting to specific major exhibitions in New York. My guess would be that they're more generally like just critiquing, um, but I don't know for sure. The only thing I would say in addition is I know that like all main, like all, New York art institutions. I know that um, September 11th, 2001 was a huge moment that all of these institutions kind of reacted together. And there was a large dialogue about what art institutions could do um, around that time. And so that's the only concrete example I can think of is kind of when all programming was responding to kind of one major um, event um, that was happening. But yes, we'll echo Alyssa's um, recommendation for the 30 years of Exit Art catalog. And also Exit Art's um, website is completely archived online. It's not live anymore, but if you Google Exit Art website, you can find an archive of every exhibition that they ever put on organized by year um, with small blurbs for each one. And so it is really easy 
to kind of go through and think about events that are happening, you know, in culture, in the world, and then also what exit art um, is doing at the same time. I think they, they make it easy to do that. And I think that's by design. I think they want to be seen that way, if that makes sense. So we have another question from the audience uh, and this visitor is wondering to what extent, um, to what extent does community have to do with the definition of alternative art spaces? It's a very good question. <laughs> um, I can go first if you want me to. Um, I would say that this is like a larger trend and um, anecdotally that I've experienced my own research about alternative spaces kind of from the 60s to the present is that um, spaces when they begin are very, very, very community oriented. You kind of know that there's a there's a group of artists that have all come together with a, with a common reason for coming together to, to exhibit their work, to work together, to work in a collaborative space. Um, and it's this this sort of this sort of catch twenty two. As soon as you start exhibiting and getting public funding and getting private funding, and you have to start employing people to do your taxes, and you need a storefront, the kind of um, it becomes harder and harder to maintain that community. And when you have lots of other sort of irons in the fire, so to speak, and so it's it's kind of I would say that alternative spaces and mainstream ones too have a kind of troubled um, connection to community. Now when I'm thinking about you know, the question that Alyssa and I were talking about earlier about alternative spaces in 2021, things like Strike MoMA, that is an incredibly community-based organization. Um, so they, I would say they run the gamut um, generally, but it's kind of a fraught concept, I would say. Um, it's not a very rosy view <laughs> of, of communities and art making, um, but it, it's something that, it, Questions of community, we should ask that every time we look at an art institution, who is their community? Are they serving that community? Do they have a well-defined community? And that can kind of give us a hint um, at their politics and um, you know, their status. Are they, are they marginal or are they mainstream? I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> and my initial reaction to the question being me is like, what is community? Um, because I think our definition of community has changed over time and is changing. And there's so many different kinds of community. So my mind Im immediately went to <laughs> Benedict Anderson's book, Imagined Communities, which was really influential on me when I read it um, in undergrad, um, just in thinking about, you know, how a national community is a sort of imagined community. And I think the digital sphere kind of opens up another space where we end up with this sort of quote unquote imagined community. You don't necessarily know everybody who's a part of your community. Um, and so alternative art spaces, you know, how much the question of like, to what extent does community have to do with the definition of an alternative art space? I think that kind of goes back to the question of like, what is an alternative art space today? And if it is kind of occupying different, maybe non-physical spaces, what does that community look like? Is it an imagined community? Like what is an imagined community even? Are there any communities that aren't imagined at this point? Yeah, I would say yes, there are, but maybe not necessarily in the urban setting the same way. You know, when exit art was operating, people came to the physical space all the time. Um, actually, the person who kind of spearheaded that the 30 years of exit art book talks about going to exit art and getting tours from Ingerman and Colo, like per in person, and it kind of being this whole community. And I think that's a question, you know, what is the community that alternative art spaces are engaging with today? And are there multiple communities or are we all one community? I mean, how exactly do communities function in this day and age? It's a great question. And it brings me back to the idea of culture. Like we say community versus communities and culture versus culture. So we think of community as so regional, um, but like, you know, in, in what sense, the community, like what is what does that mean? Um, it's a really interesting distinction. Um, I'm not sure where I'm going with that thought, but it's something I'm going to keep thinking about. It's something I always found interesting in museums too. We talk about audiences often in the yeah. plural, and I've always wondered, like, is it an audience or is it the plural audiences? Like, what what does that you know? Going back to our question of is it a culture or or the culture or are there cultures plural? Like, I think that's just kind of an interesting. Um, 
an interesting distinction to kind of think about. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, and also this conversation is making me wonder about to what extent collectors were part of the exit art community and what sort of what the price point and kind of target market for these were and like if you know anything about the kind of dynamics of patronage or whatever you want to call it like sort of donors and collectors who also may have had their hands in exit art. Exit Art did have a, a board of trustees, or a, um, I don't know if they called board of trustees, but a, a sort of um, stable of people who were either artists or collectors who did have a, a stake in, you know, in, in some of the decision making. Once again, I would love to know more about what those stakes were, how often they met. It's something that I really wish I could get into the physical archives at NYU and, and kind of um, kind of parse out. Um, yeah. It, it, you know, exit art is an alternative space, but in some ways their structure does come to mimic sort of these mainstream spaces. And the question of where do collectors belong in all of this is a really wonderful question. I wish I had more to say about it, um, but it was definitely on my mind um, thinking through the Wilson piece of like, where does collecting, um, especially thinking about Sargent um, and the kind of broader legacy of, you know, blockbuster American painting, like where does, where does collecting fall? in all of this, and I, I wish I knew more. It's definitely an avenue for future research. Yeah. Well, we are one minute over and I wanna respect everyone's time. So um, thank you so much, Alyssa and Jenna. If there's any last words you'd like to share, please feel free to do so. Um, and I just wanna thank everyone for, for joining us and for participating with your very thoughtful questions. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thank you, everyone. It was wonderful. Thank you, everyone.